family, um, Shakira Tyler, uh, from the representing the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network, and I'm here with three illustrious women in Detroit doing wonderful work uh, in the healing justice, urban agriculture, and food sovereignty movements. Thank y'all for, for being here to share your stories. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an honor to be sitting with y'all and for us to be here together in this moment. This is by no accident, right? This is divine order. And we're gonna be talking about black mothering and agrarian healing today and what that means to each of you. And, <laughs> and um, let's just get started with introductions. Is that okay? All right, so. Someone can volunteer to go first. Introductions and uh, name and affiliation. Hello everyone, I'm Mama Hanifa Ajilman and I am here representing the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network. Hi everybody, I'm Mama Myrtle Thompson Curtis. I'm representing the Freedom Freedom Growers Urban Agriculture on the east side of Detroit. Hello everybody, I am Antiano Nyar Kasagam and I am a musician, Sangoma, urban farmer, Ile Ibeji farm on the Lower East Side, and a candidate for mayor of Detroit 2021. Thank you all for that. And um, I've seen each of you grace the work and your lives generally, well, with so much fortitude and so much allegiance to our families and our communities, um, as mothers and as farmers, um, as seed keepers and educators and researchers. And it would be great if we can start but with each of you sharing a little about yourself and how you got connected to the work and how you would describe the work generally. Mama Hanifa, can we start with you? Sure. Okay. Um, <laughs> how I got into the work. Well, I think the work for me is a calling. Um, when I was a child, I spent most of my summers with my maternal grandparents, and I just want to call their names, Berthana and Sammy Riley. My grandparents um, lived in a small rural town uh, called Navasota, Texas. I, I was born and I grew up in Houston, but every summer I spent with my grandparents and even though they didn't have a large farm most of the food that we ate they grew and it was from those um experiences oh and i must also say my big mama my great grandmother lived mm. next door and so it was just through those experiences being on the land being um um, in nature that set the path for me for the life that I'm living. But again, it's more a calling than I would consider what I do as work. And I, I feel like because it is my calling, it's something that I'll be doing until it's time for me to make that next trans transition um yeah so mm. Mm, that's really that's really dope to hear thank you for that mm. mama Marta, you want to go next i would love to jump in after mama hanifa spoke to the life that she's living and that just really uh for me uh what i'm doing today uh it, it goes back to my grandmother who always had a backyard garden as I was growing up. Yes, as uh, I grew, I got away from backyard gardening, but so grateful to be, uh, I have more than a backyard garden right now. <laughs> so, but so truly grateful to have found my way back to that, um, uh, that life of 
digging in the dirt or the soil, planting, and uh, sharing that with my family and anybody else who will pay attention and listen long enough. Um, and it always invokes in me this memory of my grandmother and her three sisters uh, creating one of the most wonderful meals I ever ate. It was a very simple meal of greens, onions, and tomatoes mm. with the fine china and the tablecloth because they were visiting up from the south. Mm. And I always get that aroma and that vision in my head um, once during the season while I'm fooling around and then harvesting so many tomatoes. But I got into this um, work or the way I live now uh, by way of my partner, uh, Wayne Curtis, and his idea of saying you need a garden. I didn't realize I needed that garden. And so that's where um, the work that we do on the east side comes from. Mm. Well, I didn't know that. <laughs> I get uh, more revelations every day. Yeah, that's how it works, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, I can. Yes, yes. Um, for me, I was born and raised very far away from my grandparents. I was born and raised in Nairobi, and I only saw my grandparents not more than five times throughout my whole life maybe at least twice for the ones who were alive. And most actually, with the exception of until when I came to America, the only times I visited my grandparents' ancestral land was during a funeral. We, did, we never went. So my connection with indigeneity and land and the maternal foodways really came to bear during my experience here in America. And specifically, really coming to bear during my, my journey in Detroit. And my journey into urban farming began also because of my partner, who is a young brother from Detroit, born and raised. Lorenzo Heron, and he went to college doing uh, agricultural business management at Michigan State University, and that is where we met. And he began to pursue this small scale farming out of frustration of what big agriculture was, and that was what was fed to them in college. And it was because of just trying to assist him to water plants when he was away that I began to touch on the plants in a real way. And all together, my journey in America, 10 years now, it has me living my day-to-day -day life on an urban farm on the Lower East Side. And trying to make ends meet has not been easy or direct, but the wholesome and holistic way of life on the journey and figuring it out has brought a lot of life back to all of us and in community with my elders, my grandmothers and mothers here on this panel and my sister and others. And so I find myself here. Yeah, I think we're all here uh, for really special and specific reasons, right? It's really interesting to, to see, to hear and understand how um, each of our journeys are very distinct and unique and still very intersectional. Like we're all connected to each other through the land and through the food and, and just the, the lifestyles that we're living. And um, particularly being mothers, I think is such a powerful um, factor, such a powerful process and it, it influences the work that we do in many ways. And I'm wondering, what does mothering mean to all of you? And how is it directly connected to, you know, all the work that we do to rematriate land back to our families and communities? And how do we get people to eat healthier? And how do we get people just to reconnect to a spiritual connection, a spiritual sustenance to the land? 
right? Okay. I know. I know. I know. You hear me? Um, so could we start with whoever would like to start about the meaning of mothering and how that's connected to urban ag or food sovereignty, food justice, however you define the work. I know there are many, many terms that we throw out. So however you define that for yourself. Well, I'll start with mothering is caring for, tending to, nurturing, um, making sure there's enough, preparing for the next day, uh, reflecting on how we did yesterday or how do we draw this map to get to the point that we want to be. That, that mothering is um, just a, a, a the nurturing part. Um, and we all possess it, uh, male, female, we all possess that ability to nurture. Mm -hmm. But in that, that, that mothering, um, and, and, and when it comes to the garden, it's just very being, being very attentive. Um, and gentle and patient and uh, the ability to not give up because sometimes you plant some stuff and you don't know what's there, where did it go, is it coming and you can't just be impatient like I am with tomatoes. <laughs> tomatoes are the child that here is your job. You, 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 you raise the <laughs> tomatoes. I, it's hard for me. Mm -hmm. But um, that, that nurturing that that all oh, that the way that our mother earth nurtures us and takes care of us and makes sure there's always enough and we learn that and we give it back but being a mother for me was one of the most revolutionary things that happened in my life to turn me mm -hmm. into uh, probably who I am today mm -hmm. yeah for me as well I concur <laughs> <on> all of <laughs> that <laughs> we're here <laughs> What about you? Well, for me, um, as Mama Myrtle said, uh, mothering is nurturing. It's also nourishing. Um, it's teaching and it's giving care. It's also, um, uh, it creates a reciprocal relationship. Because with the nurturing, you're also being nurtured. With giving nourishment, you are also receiving that nourishment. As you teach, you also learn. And as we give care, we receive care. And just as all of those elements are a part of our mothering relationship as parents to our children, it's that same relationship with the earth. Because part of our purpose here is to be good stewards <laughs> of Mother Earth. And um, one of the first things that I teach um, my children when we are learning about gardening, the food warriors, I coordinate um, the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network's food warriors program. So in the food warriors program, the children learn how to grow food, they learn how to prepare the food that they're growing, but they also learn that it is their responsibility to care for Mother Earth. Because when we care for Mother Earth, mm. she will never, ever, ever not provide mm. for us. Mm -hmm. um, and so, that relationship goes hand in hand. Um, yeah, was that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Sure. okay, I didn't know that was another part that, yeah. But, and, and, and I think that that's probably one of the most important parts, especially when we see how nature, how the earth is just being defiled. 
I think that that is one of the most important parts of our work as agro agroecologists is to make sure that our children understand the importance of them embracing and caring for giving care to Mother Earth. Yeah. And, and identifying their contribution yes. in that process. Yeah, exactly. Right? Right? Yes. Understanding that the ancestors have endowed them with, with as much knowledge and magic and skills, all these things yes. that they need, that we all need in order for us to, to live and, and, and thrive. And thrive. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah, that really resonates with me, uh, Mama Hanifa. You too, Mama Myrtle. I've seen how you both mother as elders in our community. You two have mothered me as a mother. And I watch the earth mother you all. And so it's like this cyclical process um, where mothering, it's like concentric circles, right? Like we're everything working from the inside out where the with the earth is at the center and it mothers you all and then you mother us as the young people, the young mothers coming up and then and we mother you our children. Nurture and nourish us. Mm -hmm. Right. We receive nourishment from mm -hmm. you all. Yes. Yeah, the, the two way street, yeah. the, the yeah. multiple lanes. Reciprocity. Yes, yeah. for sure. <laughs> yeah. It's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so beautiful. Yes. I feel really blessed to be in community with you all because I learned so much just by being in your presence. Every 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 time it's a new lesson, it's a new revelation, um, even in this moment. So thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome and thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Sir, you got. Yeah, yeah. I got some two cents. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? These are my thoughts. Um, one thing that's very interesting about motherhood is that nobody can teach a mother how to give birth. You know what I'm saying? Like, anybody, no matter whether you have a Harvard degree, whether you work, whether you're the president, whether you are this or that, whether you're poor, when it comes time to give birth, you're alone. <laughs> you're alone, and I think this is such a point of where Mm. Everything that this world really is built around is flipped upside down because the earth, the divine force of life says that everyone is worthy and capable. I mean, we all give birth and we were all birthed, period. It doesn't matter whether you wear what clothes, whether whatever. I really appreciate that fact. It's such an equalizer. I was going to say the great equalizer. <laughs> yes. And it's such a humbling thing. That's number one. Number two, I'm also holding that and then the fact that to be a woman, after that, still in this world, people are still questioning and blocking and complicating our capacity to do what we gotta do to support ourselves and our community to live a dignified life mm -hmm. and I speak on the track of being a political candidate because it's a it's a role that needs to be played and it is a role that really influences the way we are able to survive and when you come into such a space and you see the absence of women you see the absence of mothers and you see the brutalization that we undergo just walking into that space when we come in as mothers. Anyway, all that to say, my journey into, into this work came in actually at the time of being a mother. And so that is the only way that I have known. And I really, you know, I'm still grappling with it. I am grateful that I don't exist alone out here in this city, in particular in Detroit, mm -hmm. that there are mothers available for me and that I don't exist alone. And maybe for me, motherhood is just this network 
I'm just knowing that the mothers are the people who affirm that I have a right to be here and that it'll be okay and that they are the people I can look up to when everything has fallen apart. And, and Mama Maido in particular for me in this city, in this country, represents all of that. And I'm very grateful to be continuing this journey with all of y'all. Yeah, as am I. And, and we're living really chaotic times, mm. y'all. Like it's um, the, the convergence of multiple pandemics, right, happening simultaneously, <coughs> so intently, COVID-19, obviously, and also we can't forget about the centuries-long pandemics of racial capitalism, white supremacy, <laughs> patriarchy, anti-blackness, like all of these things that really s surround us and, and, and that are in the forefront, you know, of our minds when we do this work and what we're resisting with every second. And so how has the current scenario, the world that we're living in right now and the world that we're fighting so, so hard to change, how has that influenced um, how you're living and how you're working, how you're thinking, how you're feeling? Like what, is, is anything different? <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> for me, I think what it has done is it has brought with crystal clear clarity that my work is not done. It has let me know that even if I thought, if I had a fleeting thought that, you know, I'm 65, maybe it's because every now and then the thought does come, you know, maybe <laughs> I need to slow down, but I can't. Mm -hmm. And it, it, but what it also um, has clarified for me is that I am living my purpose. And as long as I have breath, I have work to do. Mm. So that's, you know, um, that's what it's done for me. Because I've always known that these things exist, these forces exist, and sometimes they are overt in the past. They oftentimes have been covert, mm. but we still knew mm -hmm. that they existed. But right now, they are, I mean, it's just in our face, like bam. Mm -hmm. And so it just tells me when I, when I look at Atiano with the baby, you know, and I just, I don't know when I was sitting mm. here and she was sitting there holding and I was just thinking, that's why I gotta keep going. I'm a, a, a parenting grandmother of a 15 year old. That's why I gotta keep going, you know, because my purpose is wedded to our survival and if I don't do my part then I'm jeopardizing everybody mm -hmm. so even those times when I might feel like I want to sit back that's mm -hmm. that's my motivation mm -hmm. when I see that baby when I work up, wake up in the morning and I see Natalia when I see you all, and again, the nourishment that I get from you all lets me know. Mm. It lets me know. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Pandemic, come hell or high water. <laughs> yeah. 
I got a purpose. Mm -hmm. And I got work to do. And every morning, when I get up, the first thing that I do is I make my bed, and then I sit at my altar. Mm -hmm. You know, we have that daily conversation. Mm -hmm. And I'm good to go. I'm good to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. saying, you know, like it's nothing like the dark that will help mm. you see the light yeah. that's always been there. Yeah. <laughs> always. And when you said influence, I said, I don't want to say influence, I want to say impacting. Mm. Because it felt like an impact. Yeah. Because of all those things that we've been living with and knowing for a long, long time. As we study and understand our history, now other folks get to feel some of that Okay, this is, yeah. Now you understand what it's like to be stressed out, stressed on, stepped on, oppressed all the time. Mm -hmm. And I talk about waking up and you want to get, put the gloves on and fight again today. Mm -hmm. Now other folks get to understand what it's like to just get pushed to the back, pushed to the back, pushed to the back. And all that truth covered up. No, no, here it is. All of the COVID, the coronavirus, on top of the racism, misogyny, patriarchy, colonialism, serialism, militarism, mm -hmm. over policing, mm -hmm. surveillance, mm -hmm. trash food coming at you. Mm -hmm. All these conditions that we deal with face and still find joy. Mm -hmm. Now the cover's blown way off. And folks get to feel some of that. And I don't feel justification in other folks feeling stretched out. I feel like Mama Hanifa when we still look at our families and our children and think about how we caught a, caught a path for them, for their future. Mm -hmm. That work got to go on. Mm -hmm. And I feel like she was hearing me talk to myself, no, I'm tired. <laughs> and she's a little bit my elder. And so I feel convicted in that, and knowing that this work has to go on and we continue to um, deal with these impacts of, of worldly situations that are created because everything's so off kilter. Now we get some more we get more small farming going on across this world. I mean, if folks realistically look at how we're doing, and I, when I say we, I mean they, mm -hmm. because the conditions that are created create these scenarios that are right for a pandemic to happen. <laughs> and so we, we deal with, we do our part, and we teach our children and we love our children as we love ourselves. And uh, we face these pandemics and impacts, um, and they root and ground us closer to one another, you know, for those of us who care to understand what truth and reality really is. So, yeah. Well, let me tell y'all something. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. 2020. <laughs> y'all, I was woken up specifically by the death of people, the rapid, sudden, catastrophic deaths of folks who were just in good health the day before. I was woken up mm -hmm. by the fact that the U.S. government and the medical industry threw their hands up in the air and told people, stay at home, quarantine, lock yourself up in a room. What else did they say? <laughs> people are dying, left, right, and center. In people we know, people who are just too close, and the, the hospitals, the American hospitals were sending people home and people were dying. The American hospitals 
was sending people home that were showing symptoms and they were hard struggling to breathe. And they were sending them home and people were dying. And it was all over the social media and it was all over the press. And in the city of Detroit, people died. So many. In Sinai Grace, it was a catastrophe and a shameful situation that needs to be reported on more and more because things went down. And in all of that melee, people had nothing. People didn't know what to, you know, people were, could not work, people had no money. People were wondering where we gonna eat. Even us who were farmers, we felt it. Mm -hmm. And I'm 30 years old and I've been waiting I've been just doing things gradually, you know, a little bit, a little bit, just, you know, humbling myself, waiting for when I'll be invited to the table to offer my thoughts. And I realize that I cannot wait anymore. Mm -hmm. I gotta do what I gotta do, what, what I see within the wisdom of the collective, everything, I gotta do it now. And I appreciate your words that recognizing that if we don't, People are dying. It is a matter of life and death. And it became so clear. And that moment, it birthed me. And I have to live. I have to do everything within my power every single day. Now and forward. I cannot wait. And COVID on top of everything. COVID for me. Just the nature of how disease does not care. Mm -hmm. It reminded me about that there are some laws of nature. And we as a human, as a humanity, we as African people, we as black people, we cannot depend or wait or give white folks the rain ever again. Because these folks have no sense of what <laughs> is. And they cannot lead and they cannot support, protect, anything and if we do not step up and do what needs to be done <clears throat> on a personal community on all the levels we will die and we will continue to die at the hands of white officers white races oppressed folks who are struggling and needing something if we don't do every single thing within our power wherever we are now we will die because it is the law of nature and nature yeah. expects us to do what to use our brains to organize ourselves and our communities to fight for a righteous way of living in tandem mm -hmm. with each other and with the earth because if we simply don't if we wait on this white mayor on these politicians at any level who have no sense we will die and at this point October, we're in October, I'm fighting for life. I'm very aware that if I don't do certain things, even I can die. Even I, with my health, with 30 years old, I can die of this virus. Now I'm aware. I was just joking. <laughs> <laughs> now I respect mm -hmm. what we've been learning. We just was playing. <laughs> we was having fun. Mm. It's been good. Learning about herbs, learning about this and health. <laughs> and now I know. Motherhood, hey, it is a, we are warriors and we must step mm -hmm. into the action yes. of warriors. Yeah. And if we don't think like warriors, mm -hmm. we will die. Mm -hmm. And our children will die. Our husbands will die. Mm -hmm. our, everyone mm -hmm. will die. Mm -hmm. All right. What can I say? Well, you said it. We're warriors. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and as you were talking, I was thinking about a lecture I went to actually um, that was given by Dr. Nubia Warford Polk. Um, and she's in the Nubia mm -hmm. community. Yeah, mm -hmm. and she was talking about ancient Kush that predates ancient Kemet yes. and the centrality of women, particularly mothers, in that in that civilization. Um, and the the literal translation in the ancient language is of uh, to bring to bring life to death and back again. Mm -hmm. Like that was the literal translation of mother. 
and um, mm-hmm. and she talked about the queendom, which was the matrilineal society's power passed down through women <coughs> back then, and how vibrant those civilizations were um, because they were ruled by women. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and of course, we know that uh, farming and agriculture is a woman's invention. Mm-hmm. Um, and she talked about how societies were structured. She used the metaphor of a breast mm-hmm. and the nipple being the nucleus. Mm-hmm. And then the circular anatomy that surrounded the nucleus mm-hmm. fed everything else. So everything being fed from the inside out. And I was so struck by, by that history because I've always felt a very direct connection between my mothering and the earthwork and everything that flows from mm-hmm. that. And being a warrior and not, not feeling like I have no other option. Like, we are either going to do this yeah. or we're going to do this. <laughs> because, like you said, we will die, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And so, um, I'm, it's, it's just really to, to be adorned with the power mm-hmm. and, and the, the fortitude to be a mother in our communities and carrying forth this, this history mm-hmm. of women rulers and, and mothers way, way, way back in ancient African civilizations um, is it's just really divine for me in so many ways. And just knowing that our steps are ordered and that we mm-hmm. are living our purpose, right? Yes. <sighs> yeah, we're going to be all right. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. And, and, and thank you, uh, Mama Myrtle, for bringing up joy. Because yeah. I think we, we really need to be cognizant of how we're taking care of ourselves, right, in this process, and how we're living out our joy, mm-hmm. regardless of how that looks, um, because we can't deplete our, we can't give from an empty vessel, right? right? right. We have to keep ourselves tight yeah. and um, hydrated, mm-hmm. replenished. And so I'm, I'm curious what, what joy and self-care and however you define those things um, mean to you and what, what the role that it plays in, in everything that we're discussing right now. This is an example of joy <laughs> for me. Um, the, even in um, our necessity to have to kind of rearrange the way that we do things just being able to come together and have a conversation. Um, it's like breaking bread. So this, this, this is joy. Um, being in the garden every day for me is joy. It's joy, it's therapy, it's um, reassurance because every thing that I see that is growing or everything that I harvest, I know that that is a part of the process of our continuation. Again, we're talking nourishment. That brings me joy. And just seeing the babies, you know, um, on Saturdays, although I don't have the children um, in the garden, two Saturdays ago, um, one of my food warriors was with his mom, and he said, Mom, can we just go by the shrine to see if Mama Hanifa is in the garden. And they came by, you know. So it's it's the little things. Um, mm-hmm. Being at home and Nakaya deciding that she's going to help me cook today. And she's 15. <laughs> <laughs> That's a treat. That's a yeah, right. yeah. Mm-hmm. And then um, in the my day, my evening, with a wonderful book. Right now, I'm um, I'm reading um, the Cooking Genius um, by Michael Twitty. Mm. Oh my God! 
That's good. That was sacred. Yes. <laughs> And, and 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 in reading that book, he has opened up um, a dialogue between my mom and I. You know, and 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 I'm asking her questions. You know, and as soon as I ask the question, she'll say, "Girl, I don't remember. I don't know." And then before I can get, mm. and, and so I say, "Okay, mom, no, no." You know, no stress. Then chill. But you know, it was your uncle so and so who was the son. And I've been able to go back. I've been able just through those conversations that came about as a result of me reading this wonderful book. I have been able to trace my great great grandfather who was born in 1840 in Virginia. And she's been able to give me names of relatives who I can talk to that might be able to take me even further. So that's, that's joy for me. Mm. Oh, and some tomato jam on <laughs> a vegan drop biscuit. Oh, baby, that's really joy. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> if you do not know about Mama Hanifa's tomato jam, please ask her and get your whole entire life together. <laughs> because it, it will heal you from the inside out. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> okay. That's really, really beautiful. <clears throat> Joy, um, let me tell y'all about some joy. <laughs> right right. now, I really don't have much joy. Mm -hmm. I tell you that. Mm -hmm. I'm actually in the middle of a project that I have self-appointed myself to be coordinating a digital space mm -hmm. called the African music industry. Because I... At 30 years old, I have been longing to be a musician for a very long time. I have been a student since high school, throughout my hustles in America, playing in closets, trying to learn this, that. And I started to get the courage to reach out to some of the musicians I've been listening to all my life, all my <coughs> life. And with the exception of maybe two, everyone didn't even respond with a hello back. I was just saying, hello, I'm a young musician. I've been listening to you. I just want to say, I appreciate you. Not even a response. And that type of energy is the energy that I find when I try and reach out to my people on the continent. And doing this, taking this step of coordinating this, just a dig an Instagram page called the African Music Industry and trying to, trying to do what I can do. I am in a place of a very little joy because what I'm seeing, what has been revealing itself to me, is just how, it seems to me, how far we are from this world that we deserve and that we need mm. in the realest way, even inside of our own community, that when you cannot even respond to a hello. So on the question of joy, I'm not sure. I'm not really sure. On the question of Detroit and what's possible, more and more, I also now I'm just being, you know, I'm, I'm I usually err on the side of optimism in my general persona, but I'm being hit with a lot of reality and a lot of the fact that as much as I am typically surrounded by people who were very rooted and conscious and committed to community and just a good life and for good life for all of us. We have just way too many who ain't there yet. And I don't know what to do. So right now, I'm just here. Surviving, hanging on. And I wouldn't say that there is much joy. 
in me right now. I don't feel that pain, but it's a very painful and it's heartbreaking feeling. So heartbreaking. Who am I gonna report these people to? They know, but there's no justice system for for that type of justice. I can't, who, who am I going to go to and say, these African leaders, heroes of mine, they are not heroes at all. They are the ones who are singing the revolution song. You should see them. <laughs> you would think Malcolm X is alive. You would think. But they are nothing. These people, when Robert Mick the Row, our greatest, our heroes. I don't even know what is on their mind. It does not make <clears throat> no sense. And to be honest, and I say this a lot of the time, but let me tell you something as an outsider into America and into Detroit. I ain't never seen the things I've seen here because I've seen some good things and I'm surrounded by some good people. And that thing that is got going on here, it needs to somehow go back into the, the rest of our people. Somehow. I don't know. So if, if I can just offer, because I, I'm I hear what you're saying. Um, I understand to some degree, but if I can just offer the moment we allow that thing to distinguish our light, extinguish our light, is the moment that we give surrender. We cannot, even in the darkest moment, we have to go deep, deep inside and find that light because that light is our hope and even if we can't see it we know that it's there so even in this moment <clears throat> you have to find joy don't tell me when you look at mm -hmm. your babies that you don't have joy. If nothing else, let them be that spark because you know that even in the midst of all of this stuff, what I am doing, this work, my mothering, is for them. And because of that, I find joy. Or not because of, but within that, I find joy. It might not be the joy that I, I'm, that all encompassing joy, mm -hmm. but it's that joy that allows me to move beyond all of this stuff. Because when we mm. say that we cannot find the joy, mm. what we are essentially <clears throat> saying is we have allowed our light to be extinguished. And we can't let that happen. That's 
breaks my heart. Because to hear you all say that breaks my heart. It, it does. It does. Um, and Mama Lee, Kenisa, when you concentrate and focus on what you need at that point, when you can't find, and you don't feel the joy, or know what it, know what it is, and part of that is to continue living and to understand, not to judge your insides or yes. how you feel by somebody else's outer yes. appearances or what they might be doing. Because this thing that we have, this joy, this continuation, yes. it's not for those who need it, not for those who want it. Not for those who need it, it's for those who want it. You have to want it. And you gotta be able to recognize it. When they say, the student is when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. That's a wisdom and an awakening to understand joy is not frivolous. It's not frivolous. Mm. It could be a sense of peace. Mm. It could be a sense of continuing on. It could be a, the sense of I've got to wake up tomorrow to mm. take care of my baby. Mm. If we gonna split a piece of bread, an mm. apple. And a can of greens. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to figure out what tomorrow going to be like. Mm -hmm. But what, what does that joy mean? It doesn't mean, my life is simple today. And I'm thankful I've lived this long. You know? I can imagine being young and wanting all of it. But if we really and truly, we look around and look at it, we start to get real simple what I want and understand our needs mm. and what this joy look like. Mama hit it on the head, this energy that's shared right in the mm. circle. I went to bed thinking about being in the presence mm. of these people right here and woke up and laid my clothes out and was getting ready. But yeah, I only had me to get ready. You, on the other hand, a young mother, you got to get three of y'all ready and plus deal with your partner. What does joy look like? We redefine it. We don't let somebody else tell us what it is. We know it when it hit. I made it here. I might have been not on time, according to some, but I made it here. And I'm going to be here in this minute. I'm going to give what I have to give. And that joy is going to feed me until the next time it comes along. Because we are living in some strange times. But there are times, and we're going to define them, and we're going to make it mean what it's supposed to. As we encourage this young sister right here, that's my joy. To see your face again, to see them babies you again. You see them walk in with them babies. <laughs> that was that joy? We're doing well. We're doing well. We're okay. We're here. And we're going to figure out. And this is what we're doing. We're figuring. We're figuring. And we're defining. And we're sharing. You're nourishing me. I, I got a purpose. Got to check in on ATNO. Again. Because my joy is simple. We wore blue today. <laughs> I was so happy. <laughs> and you know, what does it look like? Because some folks may look at my bank account and be like, ooh, she should be sad and depressed. Because <laughs> that's their measurement. Because you're born in the world gives you value. Mother Earth told me that because she supplies all our needs. I got to figure out teach the children. We got to get it together. How to get it. How to get to the greens, the beans, the tomatoes, the herbs, the teas, the chamomile. We have to figure out how to make it work for us and not be defined by somebody else's factor. Oh, yeah. My joy is simple these days. Not doesn't mean I have low expectations. I don't. I expect justice, peace, love, respect, all those things. And I know I have to fight. I know I'm a warrior. Because I should have been gone a long time ago according to their calendar and, 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 and expectations. <laughs> I, I'm obese according to their uh, scales. 
I'm impoverished. All of that. But on a scale of a uh, uh, black woman in America, and amongst my peers, I get mama myrtles, I get honor, I get respect. From the children, I get love and I get hugs, and I'm worthy. And on the garden, I get questioned, how do you do this and how do you do that? And I even had a privilege of being able to call out and ask folks who look like me, who have been doing it a little longer, what they think about scenarios. So joy, who just keep living, baby. Find that reason to wake up tomorrow. And so, let it be the baby. <laughs> let it be the baby. Your music, mm -hmm. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Let you appreciate it. The music I that do. lives within you. All right. I <laughs> love it. See? 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 And, and, and it's, it, it's, it's, that's, that's a part of our humanity, mm. acknowledging those feelings. So I'm not, I'm not um, um, devaluing that's any right. of that. But what I'm saying is we, we acknowledge it, but we don't let it mm -hmm. take hold of mm -hmm. us. We acknowledge it, and we say, okay, I, I, I know that this is a real experience that I'm having right now, but I can't let you steal my joy. I can't, I, I, I can't let this be the, the sum total. That's right. I can't let this be the sum total. That's right. I can't let it be the sum total. Because then your power mm. is being sucked. It's being sucked out of you. And that joy replenishes. And it doesn't have to be a big thing. But just like when she talked about your music, and your eyes <laughs> lit up, and you smile, and you got Mama Shakira to smile. We all smile. Mm -hmm. That's that energy radiating. So yeah, yeah. Acknowledge it, yeah, because it's real, and we all have those moments. <laughs> we all have them. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I get so much gratitude. Mm. Ooh, because y'all scare me when y'all say stuff like that. <laughs> I'm like, oh no, <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, it's it, yeah, it's I a scary thing to feel. I did, and it's, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, yeah to feel like we're not working fast enough, yeah. and you have to pull people along, and it's and, you know it's just not. But you're doing your part. Mm -hmm. You're doing your part, and that's all you can do. You might not get the 20 that you targeted, <laughs> but you got one. Mm. You got one. Yeah. And that counts. Right? And that counts. Yeah. Mm. I need to be reminded of that <laughs> multiple times. Yeah. So thank you for yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I feel like. Y'all gave us a whole sermon. This was definitely oh. a worshiping moment. And I give so much gratitude mm. oh. for y'all imparting that wisdom. And and and, and it's really holding us. Yeah. <sighs> hmm. 
reciprocal process of mothering, as you yes. said, right? <laughs> yes. So, so this is what it's about. And and in this moment, you know, I'm reminded that mothering is not just biological. No. It's emotional. It's yeah. cultural, <laughs> social, yeah. and spiritual. Spiritual, right? Yeah. Yes. The first and foremost. Yes. <laughs> and I, I feel it, you know, mm-hmm. and I, I'm really, mm-hmm. I'm really thankful. Mm-hmm. So we, we're going to close out, mm-hmm. and I would like for each of you to share anything that is on your hearts, on your minds, something that we've already mentioned, or something that may be new, or an expansion of what you already said. And I, and I also want to uplift the theme of the 14th annual D-Town Farm Harvest Festival, preserving our, our cultures and ourselves through ancestral memory and how that's connected to everything that we've been talking about. Mothering and agrarian healing, black women doing this work and finding the joy in doing this work and the unapologeticness of doing this work, right? So... <coughs> I would like to um, talk a little bit about um, one of the plants that we grow it um, on the east side, and probably lots of folks grow it, but it's sage. Mm-hmm. And I had a really hard time growing herbs uh, early on, but for the last five years I've been growing sage. And it ties me directly to my grandmother and therefore ties me directly to my, her grandmother. My grandmother used to drink sage tea all the time. She would drink coffee once in a while, but her thing was sage tea. And she would let me sip her tea or make me my own tea. Well, never sugar in it, just, and the smell of it and the taste of it, I liked. I didn't know of its healing properties. But sage tea is very healthy. Mm-hmm. And uh, I didn't know folks burned sage until I was, what, a few years ago, smudging and things like that. And that's a whole different tea, I mean sage. But my thing is uh, sharing sage with others. It's a culinary sage and uh, drinking sage tea. Um, which is good for your lungs, it's good for your menopause, it's good for that vitamin K, it's good for uh, it's an antioxidant, uh, it's good for a number of things. But drinking that for me and sharing pieces of that plant tied me to my grandmother. And I shared some of those memories earlier and I'm sharing with others uh, the benefits of the sage plant. Um, It'll grow as a bush. You can break off of it. You can be mean to it. It'll take your abuse if you don't know what you're doing. It's a very forgiving uh, bush. And it'll continue to give. And it'll continue to nurture you. And I would just encourage folks. Um, I have plants to share. Um, and uh, that is just my one contribution of a very pleasant memory that gives me joy that gives me healing, and it ties me directly to my grandmother, her mother, her mother, um, and it's the thing that I grow um, that comes directly from the land that I'm willing to share. So, when I heard about this panel and I saw the questions come across, I thought of my grandmother and the sage plant. So, that's my piece to share. Well, um, one of the things I'll share is that nowadays, 99% of the time, I pick up the calls from my mother. That has been a huge improvement in my life. Um, Anytime my mother calls nowadays, except maybe once or twice, I pick up the call, you know? And my life has been very interesting as a result. And it's not because the conversations are particularly anything usually I'm just like damn mom you just (laughs) you know I just let her see me and nowadays I don't even try to hide the mess the anything I'm like mom you want to make a call okay go ahead 
look around. It has been very interesting to reconnect with them. Mm. And my mother is in a different country and everything. But do you know what the effect has been? Somehow, somehow, you know, to survive here in America, you know, far away <coughs> from home. <coughs> I've been here since I was 20 years old. To survive so far away, I had to shut a lot of that other life and world off. I, I don't typically call my people. And it is something I picked up when I was 14 because I've been living away from home in boarding schools a long time. And that was my survival, to literally sort of begin my life again wherever I am. And that's why I survived. And now where I am at 30 years old, I'm combining these lives and these worlds. And I can tell you guys, it's, it's an unusual things are happening in a very positive way that I am still trying to piece together. But it's very interesting to see black America and Africa in the way now I am being forced to see and hold it because I'm keeping both of these worlds alive. Mm. And to connect it with the ancestry and I almost feel it is such an, you know, in, in some ways I can identify, in some ways I can identify with how African American people in America long for Africa and then Africa is such an unknown. And I now, in some ways, in some real ways, I am isolated in very real ways from my mother, my father, my siblings, my childhood friends, my blood relatives, they're far away. It is such a weird place to be. And many of us are walking in this place. But I say again, there's something miraculous about, I'll say the community of around black urban farmers in this city and urban farmers period, but black urban farmers there's something here. There's something here. And somehow combining what I have been able to have here and what I can gather from there, something interesting is happening inside me. And it is coming out in the things I do. And it's good. It's mostly good stuff. And I think that's my little offering to my people here in America, my relatives, my blood, my kin, my friends, my family, black America is my family. And my folks back home on the continent, there's something, something is possible. And we should, as I guess we all have say, keep on it, keep doing it, because really it is a matter of our lives. Mm. It really is. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, as I was sitting here, um, a thought, it always starts as a thought, but then uh, what I realize is it's an ancestor <laughs> having their say. Uh, and one of the things, um, I probably did, I don't think I mentioned earlier on is I, I write poetry. Um, and so um, I wrote a poem many years ago and the title of the poem was When the Women Folk Gather. And so as I was sitting here um, listening, what came to mind was the last line of that poem. Um, as a, I guess, a culmination of the conversation that we had um, in this space. But the last line of that poem says, when the women folk gather, there is an ancient knowing that everything 
will be. That's a really powerful ending. <laughs> hey, Mama Elders always have the last word. Thank I'm, you. I'm all right with that. I'm all right with that. Thank you to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. For, yes, thank you for this. Mm. I want to have a hand holding moment, but I'm like, oh, no. come in. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. We will get to the other side. Yes, yes. we will. And that's all we need to know. We will get to the other side. And every moment, we come that much closer to the other side. As a matter of fact, every morning I say, okay, we're one day closer to the other side mm -hmm. of this madness. Mm -hmm.